Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And welcome to this webinar today on payments for net zero, how payments industry can contribute to the transition to a net zero economy. Um, by way of very quick introduction, my name is Catherine Brown. I am the head of inclusive impact and sustainability at Visa based in Europe. And I'm very delighted today to be joining you with an exceptional panel, which I will introduce in a moment. We have a very, very, uh, let's say, large group tuning in to us this, uh, this day to learn about this new report that has just been released. Just some housekeeping tips you should all see on your screen at the moment. <coughs> if you are having any issues hearing us, please do send the host for this meeting uh, a message. We will make sure to help you with your um, with your issues as soon as possible. We are recording this as well. So if it turns out that something is happening to your device and you cannot follow us straight through, don't worry, you can listen in at your leisure at a later stage. So just uh, to kick us off this, uh, this day, just to, for, by way of brief introduction to the topic, at Visa, we are working toward building a more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable world, one in which people, businesses, and communities can thrive, and also one in which our planet thrives, very importantly. As a global society, we have a lot of work to do towards these goals, and at all, tech, uh, at all time, record high global temperatures, extreme weather events, biodiversity loss, um, as just the beginning of what's happening these years, uh, each year we have a collective, collective global society issue that we're trying to address, exceeding the carrying capacity of our planet. And the impacts of this uh, issue that we're facing, which once felt far off and removed today, feel very, very real, as you will know. But thankfully, there is a, glo a growing global focus on the urgency of taking critical sustainability and climate action now and to make the 2020s the decisive decade of action. And we at Visa are fully committed to our role within that. Experts agree that the meeting of net zero uh, 2050 targets will require far reaching social, economic and regulatory, and of course, technological uh, changes in order to avoid locking the world into the accelerating and irreversible impacts of climate change. Few moments have demonstrated that urgency more clearly than November's COP26 summit to align national contributions, pledges, and financing needs to stay well below the two degree increase in global temperatures. The resulting groundswell gives particular rise to everyone everywhere to articulate their role and to take action now. And this groundswell is unlikely to abate. So in rather timely fashion, the role of payments in the net zero transition is the focus of this new report produced by the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership in collaboration with Visa. The report is underpinned by stakeholder interviews and existing research and is one of its uh, basically the first of its kind actually to explore the role of digital payments in supporting the drive to net zero. One of the best parts about working for a business in a central role in the global payments ecosystem, which is often operating as a network of networks, is that we have the privilege of bringing together stakeholders from across our network to effect real change. And I am delighted to have with me today, virtually, a truly fascinating panel, including Visa clients, partners, and co-thought leaders, all of whom offer unique points of view on various aspects of the challenges and opportunities of using data in this context. So with us today, we have Thomas Deloisson, the Director of Mobility at World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD, as many of you would know it. Alvaro Fernandez Velando, who is the Head of Models and Data for Santander in Spain. Uh, David Lais, who is co-founder and CPO of Ecolytic. And of course, Ben Kellard, the Director of Business Strategy at Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership or CISL. So I will ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves further as they answer their first question, as everyone comes to the table with incredible backgrounds in the space. But Ben, if I may, I would like to first turn to you to help us make better sense of the macro landscape around net zero and the opportunity for payments networks to play a crucial role 
in facilitating the transition to net zero. Perhaps you can kick us off with some, some thoughts in that space. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, uh, and I think what's really interesting is particularly following COP is that it feels like the direction is now set, the direction of travel is set for decarbonizing the economy. The question is how fast and by when, and clearly here in Europe and the UK, um, that's now a part of our laws to be net zero by 2050. And according to the um, race to zero, we now have um, 733 cities, 31 regions and over 3000 companies and 173 big investors all with net zero um, goals and that's, you know, and counting. We've got, you know, investors coming out of um, COP um, work that manage around 130 trillion of assets under management, um, responsible for around two, uh, two fifths of the world's uh, financial assets, again, signing up to net zero goals. So I think the direction of travel is, is clear. So what does that mean for payments? I mean, I think that what's really interesting is that payments is, is obviously underpins our economy. And the, the issue isn't that there aren't enough opportunities, it's there are so many, because I think you know, the decarbonisation is so ubiquitous, so is payments, it's like, where do we focus? And so I think if we look at where those big carbon impacts are and where is the role that payments intersect, that's how we sort of came up with these sort of four probably key areas, which is around the sharing economy, urban mobility, and then also how that data can be used to provide, you know, whether that's companies, regulators, city authorities, and so on, um, insights to in order to make decisions um, and also enable retail banking to, for their own shift to support that, that move to a um, sustainable and low carbon economy. And also, if we look at the kind of consumer data, we get consistently getting you know, insights that, you know, the vast majority of you know, citizens are really concerned about climate change, want to play their role, but don't feel there are real credible options out there. So, so I think this adds up to this huge opportunity for payments to be enabling these sort of emerging solutions to really go to scale. And I think that's really the sort of the, the, the opportunity that really sort of surfaced, I think, through this through this report. Absolutely, Ben. I, I think what I also really appreciated, and there were there were a lot of really fantastic data points that emerged from the research in particular. I think one that really caught my eye was that 80% of respondents wanted us to be mounting as much of a, a climate action as we were to COVID, for example, saying, you know, how can we, we've done so much in responding to this pandemic. Can we not carry that over to how we look at climate action and, and, and specifically in the role of payments and closing off what is you very well in this report as well, identified the opportunity gap um, that that does not allow people to take the next steps in making this. There's a lot of action, there's a lot of, sorry, a lot of interest, but how do we translate that into action? How do we empower citizens? How do we provide these data-driven insights? And how do we actually create very rich partnerships and opportunities for collaboration? And then also how do voices of large corporates like Visa, for example, use their influence to drive that narrative and to drive that advocacy. So those four main headlines, if you will, of how we can lean into that space, um, really fundamentally important for then even getting into specific industry actions. It sounds like you have a, a comment to that, so it looks like rather. Yeah, and, and that, that's right, because often what we're seeing is that where, if you like, the action's happening, where we're seeing these emerging solutions um, to, to create, let's call them maybe net zero solutions, some of which are clear, some are still very nascent, often aren't necessarily within the traditional stakeholder four party model of the payments um, payments network. So not necessarily with those issuing banks and so on. They're often helping in turn those people like, say, transit providers or even car manufacturers and so on, who are actually you know, looking to, to create these sort of transitions. So you're right. I think there's that opportunity and a need for, I think, a common language so that both people trying to change the real economy can understand the role payments can make and for payments professionals to see to articulate to non-payments um, stakeholders what role they can play, as you say. And I think that's one of the things that's hopefully helpful in the report is, as you say, those four key roles that the payments um, sex can play as a common language between stakeholders that don't necessarily fully understand each other's areas of expertise. Absolutely. I guess in the spirit of full disclosure as well, I'm relatively new to Visa having come from the World Economic Forum, which you would know is very much uh, known for multi-stakeholder systems level thinking and collaboration. And in particular, this is an opportunity for all to realize that this is an ecosystem challenge. Everyone must step outside of the, the comfort zone of the four party, party model to really leverage the impact that this industry can have uh, for the challenge at hand. So it's a really 
a very important point to underscore. This is a systems level issue and does require thinking outside of, uh, of the four party box. And the issues are the, the topics that we actually can lean in on very particularly. Uh, and you have done in this report as well, I think are incredibly prescient, or at least good, good starting points. Toma, I'm going to come to you first um, from WBCSC's perspective in terms of the specific domain around uh, low carbon transport and urban mobility, because 60% of global urban greenhouse gas emissions come from motorized vehicles, resulting in very dangerous trends uh, towards air pollution. That's the downside. Now, the upside is the global market for transit is in a tremendous growth phase as well. So we've quoted 400 and roughly 413 billion in 2020 up to 630 billion roughly by 2025. So there is tremendous opportunity there too. So I invite you to, to share some of your comments. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and thank you for the invitation. We are obviously really happy to contribute to this event uh, from the World Business Council. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization, just to give a little bit of background, and we gather the leading CEOs uh, together in the collaborative space so that we can advance their answer in addressing climate, nature, and inequality imperatives. That's really our motto so that uh, we can achieve a vision in which 9.5 billion of people live within the boundaries of the planet by 2050. And when it comes to transport, really, I think the narrative is fairly simple. Exactly as you mentioned, Catherine, just now, there is tremendous growth that is forecasted towards the mid-century uh, that is mostly going to come from developing countries. Nevertheless, a lot of the focus is happening on um, road transport and urban road transport in particular, because this is really where a lot of the emissions are coming from. Um, when it comes to the priorities on where to act, I think we all in, have in mind the idea of electrification and moving to, to zero emission technologies for the vehicles as quickly as we can. But we also know at the World Business Council and together with most of our partners now that this is not going to be enough to remain within a one and a half degree uh, trajectory for the transport sector. This needs to be accompanied with tremendous improvements in what we call the efficiency of transport, which essentially means traveling more with less impact. And if you, if you take a step back, this means decoupling the growth that I've just talked about with the impact that it actually creates. And that, in our opinion, can only happen through digitalization. And that's where, you know, payment is of high uh, importance, because as uh, Ben has mentioned, payment is underpinning all sectors of our economy. And in the case of mobility or urban and road-based uh, mobility, clearly payment is at the core of what many have called mobility as a service, which essentially is multimodality, but in an integrated manner. You will have heard about seamless mobility, and obviously payment is one of these elements that make uh, mobility as a service seamless. Um, another one clearly is around uh, the access to cities. We've seen so many cities now uh, moving into zero emission zones, even banning access of cars to their city centers, managing space and managing tolls. I think uh, the, the, the people based in London will know that there is a digital system and a payment system attached to this uh, notion of access. Um, the other one that we see where payment is actually critical and starting to emerge in Europe uh, is what we've called the uh, mobility wallets and what connects to the, to the related emissions. We've seen many companies and actually startups now rushing into that space in providing solutions for companies to change the way their uh, employees are, are commuting, which is obviously one of the key reasons for us to travel. And uh, this is uh, another area where uh, uh, payments and the related data can actually help to reduce uh, carbon emissions by providing better information and empowering citizens in the way they actually consume and, and move uh, or, or consume mobility services. The other uh, area where payment is extremely uh, interesting is, is down to the planning and the management of mobility. I've talked uh, just a second ago about the electric vehicles and uh, the transition to zero emission technologies. We will not be able to plan adequately uh, at the pace that is required the charging infrastructure for electric vehicles without uh, sharing uh, data, including payments data, to better understand the patterns of, uh, of usage uh, of electric vehicles so that we can 
uh, plan in the space, uh, in the city space, which is very scarce, uh, the right locations for charging infrastructure. But beyond just this, this example on, on electric vehicle charging infrastructure planning, the simple uh, usage of payments data for the better uh, capacity management in, um, in the public transit could also be very useful to adapt real time uh, the, the, the capacity of, uh, of transit to the demand or to specific conditions. And of course, to support also adequate policy making, whether it's on tariff or uh, specific access rules again, uh, we see really payment data taking a, a, a major role as part of these use cases I've just mentioned. And obviously all of that requires this data to be shared. So this is really perhaps uh, the space where we need to move the discussion to is as to how do we share this data? How do we enable these ecosystems to, to emerge? That's absolutely a very good point on that as well, because especially government spending or government budgets around infrastructure planning is incredibly expensive to make a mistake on that one. And very hard to go back and replan this. So the ability to make data-driven decisions uh, ahead of that planning is a, a real efficiency play for a number of different entities in that equation. So really a fundamental ask. I'm going to come back to you later in particular on this mobility as a service concept as we start talking about other elements that we've talked about. But let's um, let's turn to you, Alvaro, actually, because again, on the data front, now you are representing Santander and the opportunity for banks, for retail banking, obviously, was very nicely illustrated in this point because we know a regulatory shareholder and customer demand is skyrocketing uh, at the moment for banking services and products that are tilted in this direction. So if I could turn to you to illustrate a bit what Santander is doing in this space and your observations from working on this report. Okay, hello. Uh, so in first place, thank you for the invitation. So it's very interesting to be here. So to give you some, some context, uh, Santander uh, has a ambition to achieve uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, but not, not only with the internal operations that are already carbon neutral since 2020, but also helping our clients to uh, reach this target um, as the result of any lending, advisory, or investment activity that we provide for Santander. So within this framework, um, we are developing a lot of projects, some of them related to payments, some of them related, for example, to green products, including green mortgages, energy efficiency loans, <coughs> loans to install, <coughs> sorry, loans to install solar panels, electric vehicles, and low carbon agriculture, for example. But in the case, for example, of payments, I think one of the first services that we have announced is the eco cards projects in order to remove all the plastic from the uh, credit and debit cards of our customers moving from traditional plastic to corn-based uh, materials that are more, much more <clears throat> um, uh, sustainable uh, for the case. Uh, so, for example, only with this initiative, we are saving something close, close to 1,000 tons of CO2 every year. So, this is our first initiative, but um, I think the most important one, and that's the data part of the project, is related to carbon footprint measurement for our customers. So in this case, um, we have, as you can imagine, huge amounts of data, transactional data, millions, uh, thousands of millions of transactions every year. So we have been working uh, in trying to convert these transactions into um, carbon footprint, footprint for every individual, but not only for the individual, because at least in Spain, we, we see that uh, customers are not really aware of the carbon footprint that they have, but also for the companies. So we are creating some kind of a, a green marketplace where we can connect uh, the interests of these customers that are already worried about uh, the carbon footprint, but they, don't, they, didn't, they didn't really know all the details, but also it's a marketplace where our companies can benefit also from these um, calculations because we are offering this same calculation to the companies and to the individuals. This is very important because businesses, uh, well, and not only businesses, but also the administration, 
I think they have very poor data in order to know the real impact. And maybe the banks here can help not only to our customer base, but also to the society uh, generating these insights uh, through this analysis. There is an issue here about data privacy because um, all these calculations, all these carbon footprints cannot be done without the user consent. So there are some consent, some legitimate uh, cons uh, calculations that you can do, for example, for fraud. But in this case, you need the explicit consent of the customers. Mm -hmm. So regarding that we have, a, although we have a huge uh, database, uh, we have to be very aware of the data privacy issue and uh, offer this only to those customers that have already, that have already uh, approved to do it. And when we have this data, what we are doing now is trying to convert this into insights for our companies and for the administration. Uh, for example, the, the one month ago, we were, we were talking to one of the big uh, electric companies in Spain because they didn't know where to uh, uh, put the chargers for the electric vehicles across Spain, mm -hmm. but we have this information. So maybe using this statistical analysis, with uh, 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 no individual data, no individual data points for uh, individual customers, we can help all the companies, not only one, but all the sector, in order to improve the mobility, for example, in Spain of electric vehicles. So, uh, well, it's a really, really interesting issue. We have a lot of information. We are starting now because, uh, as I have told you before, there is still not this customer awareness about the carbon footprint, but our idea is to move the society and to create this awareness in order to to to, to move to these uh, targets for 2050. Absolutely, and to really answer the call or the demand that you see coming from consumers on this, I should mention that we concurrently have just released uh, information about consumer trends from a, a very large scale global globe scan study, actually, as you say, global globe scan study um, that uh, polled 31,000 individuals across 30 some odd markets that really honed in on the consumer trends and the consumer movements on this. We also, at the same time, commissioned some best book research across uh, a number of regions as well to even further hone in on retail banking and, and consumer trends towards banking as well. And customers are voting with their feet. So the opportunity uh, is upon us, if you will. To, to be able to offer services and to provide those insights and that information uh, to individuals. Again, um, keeping in mind data privacy, but also the reality that this is, this is actually something that especially uh, young affluent individuals want and need in their banking services. So the fact that you're moving in that direction is most definitely timely. And I think it's a good opportunity then to pivot to David Lice from Ecolytic as we talk about mapping footprints and using data to be able to elevate that kind of information. So uh, also a question at the moment with the release of our Visa Eco Benefits Bundle uh, in partnership with Ecolytic. David, I bring you into the conversation to talk about the opportunities that they you see and, uh, and are, are working together and how this is going to become uh, very, very prominent say the retail banking and outside of retail banking sectors as well. Pleasure to do. Um, I guess it's all set, right? Consumers want it. Uh, we have the data. Uh, we just need to do it. Um, so uh, maybe a little bit of background of myself. So I'm one of the co-founder of Ecolytic. Um, I'm actually in the payments industry for the last 18 years. Uh, sustainability for just six years. Um, and I just try to bring them together uh, on the data side, but also on the consumer side. And um, Essentially, Ecolytic is, is all about helping consumers understand their individual um, influence on the environment. And surprise, we're using payment data to do that. Um, so we, I think it's, it's, it's very simple. Consumers, I think you and Ben already touched on it, consumers want to do more, but they're struggling to figure out how. And um, so the good news is um, pretty much everything that we do is somehow related to a payment. It's also bad news somehow, right? Because everything costs money. 
but um, that means we have the data um, from the finance industry. So we have the data to build a bit of it of transparency on where do I spend most, where do I have a really big influence on the planet, and how can I uh, basically reduce it. So using those data is, is basically very critical um, in order to, to move the consumer and um, help him um, understanding uh, where, where to change. Um, I think this is a, a huge opportunity. So I'm, I'm very much delighted that we are part of the, the, the eco bundle from Visa because I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic approach on, and also a very simple approach on using what we have in, in order to guide consumers to, to act on it. Um, and it. And it brings it uh, very well together. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to how, where this initiative uh, leads us all. Fantastic. And I actually, I see already people are starting to put uh, questions into the Q&A box on the side. I was going to say, after two years of a pandemic, I'm sure everyone is very native on how to find the Q&A box, uh, the comments box, and type their questions in. But just in case, bottom right-hand corner, we do have a Q&A um, section. So as we are following up on some questions with the panelists, please do feel free to enter your questions here. We will draw from those to, to, to speak directly to your questions and concerns on these topics. Um, before going in again to the larger group with some additional questions, there is one question that already popped up, David, that we knew was going to happen. So maybe just addressing it um, out of the box. How is CO2 calculated vis-a-vis um, -vis the ecolytic composition? Oh, I love this one. Um, I think so the truth is, and, and I think everyone we're working in this field is, um, sustainability is, is a huge data play and unfortunately we don't have all data available yet to to really build full transparency and because we know that we have a very very uh, transparent approach so we're working together with a non-for-profit um, and we have built an open standard around the data that we use the, the scientific backgrounds that we have our methodology that we use and we basically invite everyone to collaborate on it so it has two advantages first of all um, we, we are very transparent on what we use and how we use it. Um, that alone leaves room for improvement because we're not saying we have found the ultimate tool. We're saying we have to find it in, in collaboration. And um, there's another aspect to it. Um, there, because we're missing a lot of data, sometimes those gray spots are getting lost when we accumulate data, um, which means um, to, to find them, we need to have a very transparent look on those. And um, what we do, we pinpoint um, certain areas where there is a huge lack of data and where we need to do more research. Um, and that is something where, where even governments now look into it and, and started to fund particular research with research institutions to, to look at those, those gaps to become even better in the calculations that we have. And uh, the other nice thing is that um, actually science loves it or the research institutions loves it because um, it's very easy to uh, contribute the data and suddenly their, their results will immediately find uh, a way to consumers, um, which is normally not the case, but let's face it, not so many consumers are actually uh, looking uh, and, and reading uh, science papers. And very quickly, same same uh, contributor to this question, where can that methodology that you've discussed um, initially be found? From the yes, uh, very easy. Uh, EU-OSR.com um, is the, the open wiki where, um, or without the minus, EU-OSR, um, the op European Open Sustainability Registry um, is the open wiki where everything can be found and um, also get in touch with us. Perfect. So maybe we can parrot that uh, URL into the chat function as well so people can click through and explore cool. further. So moving on again, back to the, the group at large for a moment, because they're all coming from very different perspectives on this. So I'd love to hear from you a bit more on what you see as the subsystem barriers um, that we will need to overcome and address to be able to see actionable uh, impact in, in moving forward in this space, but also the opportunities on the other end um, that perhaps either result from these subsystem barriers or are parallel to these barriers that you see. So Ben, maybe I can start with you if you have any um, sort of high level thoughts on this. Yeah, I, th I think there's some common ones, almost like whichever system you look at. So um, one which is starting to be addressed is around pricing and externalities. So that's sort of jargon for essentially the sort of either positive or negative impacts on society and nature that aren't factored into financial calculations. That could there be anything from carbon emissions to waste and so on. 
particularly in Europe with the you know, Green New Deal and as we start to have polluter pays regulations and putting a price, serious price on carbon and so on, that's all starting to change. That, that's kind of one. I think the second is actually for companies in particular to see this as an opportunity. Many, I think a lot of the focus is around how do we mitigate, how do we reduce our carbon impacts? Um, and what they're not necessarily thinking about is how are we going to be impacted by climate changes already in the system? And what's our opportunity to use our core capabilities as a business to lead that, you know, decarbonisation? And payments is an example of that, but the same is true if you're building houses, building transportation infrastructure and everything else. So, so that's seeing the opportunity and then pointing innovation in that direction. I think another common um, challenge is that currently systems are, are very fragmented and not aligned. So if you just take, for example, you know, recycling. Often, you know, a lot of plastics that are being used won't be recycled in a lot of, you know, kind of curbside recycling because the system isn't currently aligned. Um, and I guess the, the and when we start to see that um, both alignment, the right regulation, seeing as an opportunity, the real agenda there is then to how do we really scale these opportunities and also then unlocking the right financing. And again, I think that's something that's changing, particularly with the um, European taxonomy. Uh, on, on green finance, that's going to start to, I think, unlock the right sort of funding. We're already seeing that growth in green bonds. So there'd be, I think, some some common ones. So pricing and externalities, which is a regulatory area, you know, um, al aligning the system, um, whether that's infrastructure, regulation, so on, and then sort of seeing the, the grasp and the opportunity and find the right pricing mechanisms for them. And so they show up in a lot of these subsystems, whether it's mobility or, um, or, or plastics uh, and so on, and then circular economy. Absolutely. And actually, on your last point on circular economy, because that uh, to me is a really interesting. First of all, it's one of the four areas that we focused in on for this report. Um, but it's an incredibly interesting one vis a vis your point about the fragmentation and the lack of connectedness and connected network. It is a tremendous opportunity, in fact, um, at the moment, one that we at Visa are going to be leaning into in particular because this take make waste economy is estimated to contribute to around 50% of global emissions. It's not insignificant. Um, but that actually the sharing economy, circular economy, more regenerative economy um, could generate to 335 billion by 2025 at this point. So there is actually tremendous opportunity in that. Um, but to your point, it is and remains uh, fragmented by, in, in nature. The connectedness, this is an area where I do believe that payments have a very strong role to play in creating that connected tissue, that connective energy around it. So. You've uh, shared some some thoughts around that in particular. Thomas, I'd like to come back to you first and foremost, actually, on this particular topic of sharing economy, because you had mentioned mobility as a service um, and obviously the, the rental component and leasing component that docks into the sharing economy conversation. I'd love to get your thoughts on that um, at large, but then to go back into other topics or sub barriers and opportunities that you see in the realm of uh, mobility and transport. I think shared economy is an extremely good example to pick because um, it is on one end where the disruption has, has occurred in what used to be a little bit of a monopolistic view of transport or let's say binary. It was either the private car or public transit and suddenly in the middle 10 years ago appeared services that were allowing to share the assets that the OEMs were producing and somehow compete with the public transit inside. Uh, uh, cities and so that has emerged really as I think as an interesting case and I was no later than last Monday uh, listening to some uh, consultancies telling us that this is really where the growth in terms of business is, is happening in the next 10-15 years because of the reason I mentioned before this is going to be where the cities are going to look in order to try to find efficiencies in taking uh, individual mobility uh, more towards shared mobility and not shared necessarily in terms of sharing the vehicles, but I'd say traveling together and more efficiently. Um, it, it is also a, an element of interest because uh, fundamentally uh, a lot of OEMs and uh, industry players to pick the point from Ben have invested into these technologies without always seeing the, the, the return on investment uh, as, as quickly as they would want to, to, to do, uh, I would say, as per usual uh, practices and products. But the capacity is there. Uh, and if you look at uh, uh, what uh, uh, companies like Uber have been doing and growing and their valuation has been now making them too big to, to fail, essentially, they are really taking part in the entire mobility ecosystem conversation. And the OEMs 
who some, some of them actually have shares in Uber or, or in others, um, uh, are, are clearly focused on leveraging this capacity in which they have invested, which is to create these shared models, and therefore, of course, to leverage the data that is within it. And so that really is, is leading me to the, uh, the other point that Ben mentioned and, and your question around the sub uh, the subsector barriers. And indeed, one of the key barriers in, in enabling or let's say unlocking the power of, of data and payment data in this instance is the ability to share it. And very often, because of mm. the traditional models of thinking and the traditional mindsets, we do think that there is more value in data in owning it. But in reality, there is more value in, in data in sharing it. I think Fernando uh, showed it. So it is going to be down and one of the barriers is really creating this trust. And this is this is obviously a, a common word and everybody talks about creating trust within data sharing ecosystems. But interestingly, one of the key focal point of the really imminently coming uh, data governance of the European Union is going to be creating those mechanisms of trust, making sure that individuals have better uh, safeguards when it comes to sharing their individual data, as per uh, Fernando's comment, but also that the private sector is encouraged uh, to uh, share the data and has also the, some level of governance as to how the, the, the value that is created by sharing this data is, is, is returned. And so in the case of mobility, this is really fundamental if we want to, to move forward. But so trust is really one of these key uh, sub-sector barrier. But of course, uh, one way of also uh, uh, overcoming trust is to build a project together, you know, to share a vision and climate, uh, I mean, addressing the climate imperative is clearly one very important and central vision that everybody is now relying to. So um, I think these two would be uh, would be quite uh, a good way of to start uh, in terms of uh, understanding what barriers uh, are existing within the mobility system uh, related to the, the, the emergence or the unlocking of uh, powering of data. So the, the creation of trust, uh, sharing visions, and obviously with this uh, articulate those regulatory frameworks that we are so keen on creating that can uh, support the better collection and usage of data, but also uh, sets the right governance. I've just given some examples with the European Commission data uh, uh, governance, um, but also drive the creation of value by focusing on clear use cases. Shared mobility is one of them, but I've also mentioned a couple in the, uh, in the previous comment. And mm. most importantly, make sure that this is integrated uh, beyond just the mobility sector, because a lot of the value that is going to be created through data sharing exists in pools that are indirectly connected. They are socially, uh, there will be social social value that will emerge out of uh, data sharing. There will be obviously environmental value and the reduction of emissions. And we need to find a way for the business to access these pools uh, without being mm -hmm. just uh, uh, constrained to it. Absolutely, I love that you have highlighted um data as a key component in a sharing economy. I think a lot of the traditional definition of sharing doesn't actually broaden to the data realm, but quite frankly, I, I could not agree with you more. The sharing of data, especially vis-a-vis -vis our climate targets, is critical. And the building of trust in that uh, and the ability for government to get behind that and start to build that infrastructure and share projects that should that create that trust and create that um, that element of of collaboration that is going to be fundamental in terms of sharing of, of, of information. Could not possibly agree more. That's really a first step. And I imagine that it, it is something that uh, David, I, I will pull you in in a second to address that. So maybe perhaps uh, prepare some comments to back up on that and then we'll go to your to your sub barriers and opportunities. But before I, uh, I move over to now, there is one question from the chat that I think is very interesting and impression at the moment with the pandemic and the issues around public transport that we're facing uh, in terms of uh, the current climate, how do we, uh, how do we incentivize public transportation uh, and the more sustainable transport in such difficult uh, times as these? Like what is our strategy or is there an opportunity to bounce back, if you will, into public transport post-pandemic? Well, first we have to always remember that uh, mobility is contextual and that whenever it's possible, indeed the right choice from an emission perspective is public transport, but we have to keep in mind that many people do not always access public transit. 
And so uh, we should just make sure that this is not, a, I'm not making a blanket statement. Now, when it comes to the pandemic and the inflection point in ridership that we have seen, first, a lot of these figures have now climbed back up. And with all the measures and the health and safety habits that we have all gotten into, taking public transit remains a possibility in many areas. It's just perhaps a matter of a, of a higher uh, uh, attention to, uh, to how do we behave. Uh, nevertheless, the sharing economy is really seen now in many uh, countries, um, and it's notably the, the um, uh, emergence of mobility as a service frameworks, which really integrates public transit and other modes of transport under one single um, governance with data as its center. These are also starting to emerge in, uh, in you might have seen the announcement in Italy, uh, Japan, mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, the Nordics have been in the game for, for a while now, and I think uh, UK is soon uh, or, or already uh, into, uh, into this too. So um, this is really going to be a way for the public transit to leverage technology and the sharing of data to uh, somehow complement their current offer and better, better serve the, con the, the users and better connect with them when it comes to the, the service that they provide. So I do see this really as, a, as one opportunity as long as we find the right governance and we make sure that every stakeholder from the entire ecosystems, from the mini startup that provides scooter services to the massive behemoth that is the public transit of a major city, all find their space in uh, uh, harnessing their data to create shared value. Absolutely. David, I did forewarn you on this. Sharing data as part of sharing economy. Go, your perspectives. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Well, that's it, right? Sharing data is is the new new oil, the new goal. And I think uh, Thomas put it very nicely. I mean, the, the real value, is, at least when it comes to sustainability, is really when we find a common ground on, on on sharing the the data that we need in order to calculate the influence, to 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 build this transparency, and et cetera. And uh, and of course, there, there are a lot of challenges. First of all, how do we do it technically, but also how do we keep uh, the privacy of the individuals and the companies? Um, how, can we, can, how can we achieve all of that uh, by, 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 by not you know, compromising on the data itself, but rather um, figuring out how we can build this trust around it? So I think this is, these are the key challenges. Um, and, and I think this is happy to play the ball back to you. I think this is one of the the, the, the very nice roles that you are uh, as Visa be building this network, right? Bridging the, the, the banking or the fines industry to, to the retail industry and then overall also to the consumer. Um, everything in that kind of network that usually touches your roles or, or at least the, the network around it is where we need to come together, find collaboration and, and, and start figuring out how we can share data and or share the value of the data. And um, so, yeah, I think this is this is where it puts you in a very unique position um, where, where I'm, I'm really keen um, to, to see how this will be developed further on um, and, and see how we, we can actually make the use out of it, not only on the retail side, but also um, from, from, from maybe the merchant side as well to get this into it. But the key problem is the same, right? We need to share the data and we need to do it safely and we need to figure out how we can keep the value. Absolutely. Uh, and I think what's very important to underscore here is that they, you know, the time scales. So the time from you know, the translation from data being shared to action and actionable impacts that are positive and letting uh, consumers see that, letting individuals see that actually there is value, immediate value of sharing of data, that this is not obscured or, or that has an excessive time scale. We need to be able to translate it quickly. And hopefully this is something where Visa can, in fact, be a massive enabler to be able to to accelerate that pace of of impact through the sharing of data in the absolutely world. I think that's that's definitely where we hope to play anyway absolutely i think the the, the good news is that um there is already so much data that provide a tremendous value for for let's say the consumer in this example um so there is a very very good starting base um to already help consumers and while we do this, we can start figuring out how do we get uh, access to the rest and how do we structure the rest. But I think starting uh, right now uh, or the starting point is already so good that we will see tremendous change uh, happening soon. And um, 
while we start the way on this path, um, I'm pretty sure we will solve the other challenges as well. And um, it gives us some times while we have already some good results. And I think this is this is always very motivating if, if, if you get started somewhere and you all immediately see some results. Exactly. And then that ultimately helps um, banks, for example, ever to be able to better design services and products, data services and products, because there is that authenticity and that rapid iteration, let's say, of the data availability and then data usage. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic in particular from the voice of Santander, but also other system barriers that you're seeing that we'll need to overcome or opportunities from your side. Yes, the data sharing point is really interesting because I think the value here is that uh, if you join all the data, there is a lot of data symmetry. So for example, we have a lot of transactional uh, level data but we don't have the basket level data that may be really useful in order to understand the behavior of, of a customer. The administration have very rich data at macro level that uh, maybe we connect this micro data with this micro transaction data, we may find very interesting conclusions. The energy sector, they already have a very interesting view. But the thing is that at least up to now, uh, all this open data uh, regulations have only applied to banking, uh, like PSD2. So, so where you, uh, as a consumer, you can move your data between banks and, and then you can have this uh, 360 view of your transactional data within all the banks. But maybe it could be very interesting now to have this, uh, like a cross-sectoral, uh, sorry, cross-sectoral um, initiative regulation in order to open the data, not only from the banks, but from the other sectors. And uh, we give this value to the uh, companies, we give this value to the to the customers, because uh, they, for example, one of the uh, more uh, interesting cases that we are working now is related to the European funds for the ener energy transition. So if we are able to uh, profile the customer and, and have a complete understanding of the current situation and the things that this customer has to do and the European funds that may apply for this situation is a perfect uh, offer for all the all the customers. So I think this, this um, uh, data sharing initiatives would be really helpful and in order to, 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 to have a better value for our customers. Absolutely. And I see something as well from the chat. I actually have, interestingly enough, two Q&A bubbles. So I'm just sort of vacillating between the two. And this is something where, Alvaro, you also may have uh, some thoughts on this too, but there's a real interest in recycled materials, card materials. So as you are uh, issuing cards to your yes. consumers, huge emphasis on what those materials are. Uh, and I see a question now in the chat from Arijit. Ar 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 uh, apologies if I've uh, mispronounced your name. What, what is Santander doing on that front? Or the, let's see the interest that you're hearing from consumers on, on the actual materials of the cards that you're going to be uh, distributing to your clients. The question actually in particular is, is Visa doing anything in this regard? Yes, we are. As part of our eco bundle, we have a recyclable and reusable materials program as well. But Alvaro, to you. Well, I think the first initiative is to remove all the materials. So uh, you, you can now pay with your mobile phone. So you don't need any plastic at all. So I used to uh, live home with a lot of plastics in my wallet, but now I, I, I am going always with my uh, mobile phone and I can do all the payments without any plastic. And the experience for the customer, for example, is when you order for a credit card, the first minute that you uh, ask for your credit card, you already have this available in your mobile phone. You don't have to wait for a week or for two or three days to receive the credit card in your in your home. So I think the first, the first initiative is remove all the materials, not only the plastic, but also core materials or all the recycled uh, alternatives that you, that you may have. Uh, Santander in Spain has the highest share of the market in terms of mobile payment, close to 70%. So, so uh, most, in fact, we have grown a lot in customers because of this possibility that other banks didn't offer. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, yes, uh, what we are doing now is to remove all the non-sustainable materials and use only recycled PVC or cone-based materials 
for the credit cards. One of the uh, things that used to happen in the past, it was the expire the expiration date of the of the credit card uh, uh, was maybe two, three, four years, but the plastic lasted 10, 20 years. So this doesn't make any sense. So you have uh, to, to, to also to use materials that are uh, related to the expiration of the credit card. But uh, anyway, I think the, the, the best alternative, no material and payment with the mobile phone. I think that's the best customer experience. And I think that migration is starting to happen. I think globally as well, there are a number of people who still want something in their pocket, in their wallet, uh, their physical wallet. And for that, there are a lot of emerging solutions and from us as well around uh, using ocean plastics, those materials that are by nature uh, more sustainable, but ultimately in the transition to say, you know, how long will it take to actually have most people or all people comfortable um, with not having something physical in their pocket and, and being along on that journey as well. So we have about seven minutes left. So what I'm going to do is to ask each and every one of you, again, just do a bit of a around the table or tour de table, as we would say, um, around your last thoughts on practical guidance for all types of players within this payments ecosystem um, that you have or initial ideas, thoughts, implications, and very importantly, next steps uh, in moving this conversation forward. Because as we mentioned, this is really very first of its kind information that is out there on the wall of payments. It is incredibly, it behooves us, let's say, to move very quickly to action on this point. So really practical guides, guidelines, and next steps. Ben, I'm going to start with you on this one as a, a key partner in this, this uh, report. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the main one is probably um, an invitation. So for those involved in decarbonizing key systems to, you know, reach out and involve both payments companies and crucially as intermediaries, the retail banks, you know, the issuing and, uh, banks. So I think to, to bring them in, say, look, how can you be actors in helping us? Because often they will figure out if we went almost these black box of these net zero solutions in whatever the system might be, but they won't understand the role of payments. And there's clearly a transactional role that payments can play. We've talked a bit about data flows around, say, carbon, but also I think as we start to extend out from that as well, we want to know more things like how long has that material been in the system? How much, you know, have we saved? How much carbon have we saved? So also things start to look at, you know, natural impacts within being held in the system, which are all potentially new data flows for um, payments companies as well. So, to, so I think there's that bringing them in. And for payments companies to also proactively be looking at that kind of sweet spot between what parts of the economy do we need to decarbonize, where are the big carbon impacts and the potential role of payments. And we've identified a number of those in the report, but I think it's for um, all acting in the payments network to really proactively see that as the huge opportunity, because that's where the big, you know, the big decarbonization will come from, the new payments flows. Um, it's, it's the kind of really clear win-win. And I think, and often what we miss, I think is, is forums to have that conversation for those actors trying to decarbonize systems to really diagnose what's needed co-create those new solutions align the system around it and that's why organizations like wbcsd wef and others are you know um, are great at bringing those actors together so i think it's about bringing creating those those groups and actively playing a role in it you're very talented ben i'll i'll take it forward there um essentially uh, about guidance uh, and, and related to the diagnosis uh, points that Ben just mentioned, fundamentally, we have now worked on the topic of digitalization and data that were at the World Business Council for more than three years. And I've realized that essentially we can't wait, you know, if we are to try to for the public sector to create the perfect and super safe and watertight systems and regulations we will not be able to really leverage the data that is already available in time for decarbonizing transport, which we know is one of those key sectors. And what we have realized is that there are still some gaps that are preventing people uh, more generally, and namely companies and the, the public sector to share data, to create shared value. One, data often, uh, uh, the value of sharing data, sorry, isn't often very easy to quantify and uh, nobody mm -hmm. will want to invest mm -hmm. into anything without having a clear visibility on uh, on the return on investment. Second, operationalizing, you know, how do you operate data sharing, whether it's from a physical infrastructure, but also from a, which data do you collect to create what? 
And this is really use case dependent, city dependent, almost per person by person dependent. And that is also a space where there is a, this is also a gap. This is also something where the capacity does not always exist. And finally, of course, through dialogue, uh, helping the authorities to regulate those data governances and to support the creation of these safeguards in, in privacy, in security, in generating the value. These are the gaps that we need to fill. And very simply, we believe at the World Business Council that the private sector has the lead in everything digital and needs to very quickly come together, declare their ambition uh, when it comes to uh, decarbonizing the society, but in, in our case, it's transport, identify those use cases and work and work to prove the value, help operationalizing and support the policy making for these governances to exist. And so we call upon every business that has data to simply join the coalition that we are going to launch this year. And Visa, we hope that you're going to join us too, um, to, to basically start working on this. And David, also, you're welcome to come. We need to, to harness the strength and the knowledge that exists to move. We need to move forward. And uh, I just finish on this very point. If we don't start to act, we will never know where we're going to land. And fundamentally, we know that when we start to share data, we will create new problems. And we need to find those flexible approaches where we create these governance that are evolving. And I think the, the only way to get there is to start doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Avro, role of the private sector in driving these, uh, this forward. Your final thoughts on this? Yes, I think we have a, a huge responsibility. Uh, we have a, a huge power is the data, but with this power, we have this responsibility in order to help the society, the companies, the individuals, in order to be um, uh, more efficient, more sustainable in the future. So our main mission now is uh, create this awareness into our customer base, into the society, and try to help them not only with this awareness, but also linking any uh, strategic initiative from the government, from the European Union, from any administration um, to, to transform the society and to create a better society from, from the bank. Huge opportunity, Absolutely. huge responsibility. And everything is based on so it's a lot of work for us. <laughs> Correct. And David, turning to you for the 30 second final word. All right. I think I would just uh, mention again collaboration, right? So um, digitalization is the tool. Yes, we need data. Yes, we need to share it. But uh, it all starts with us. We need to sit together and collaborate. That means sitting down with the competition, sitting down with the people you would normally not talk to. And, and and working together on, on on one common goal, keeping this planet healthy and and livable for many many other generations. And I think this is this is where it starts in in, in it's our mindset and our heads. And um, that's the first starting point. And then everything else we will figure out on the way. But we will do it together. Fantastic! What a great note to end on. And uh, in the spirit of Swiss time, ending on time, I just wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists who have really been very insightful and informative today. I've learned a lot myself uh, and also to our viewers for very active listening and participation. So thank you for joining again. I wish you all a lovely day and please take care of yourselves this holiday season. Thank you for your time.